Right here we have Mr. Abdullah Hamimi, and Abdullah, we're very thankful you can be with us. Abdullah has contributed long-standing efforts working closely to mobilize large-scale collective action between Muslim university students associations all across Victoria. Leading many community initiatives, Abdullah's dedication lies in educating and equipping his wider community to confidently practice and share Islam with others. He is the Australasia Outreach Specialist for IERA and also an executive board member at his local Muslim community organization, Pillars of Guidance Community Center. Motivated by challenging existing ideological frameworks, he is committed to uplifting his local and global Muslim community. If you could please give a round of applause for Mr. Hamimi. And to my left here, we have Dr. James White. Uh, James White comes from Phoenix, Arizona. He is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. He's the author of over 24 books and has participated in over 170 moderated debates. And we are very excited that he has come to Australia. He has just recently ministered in Sydney last week, and he is also a part of the Hills Bible Church Apologetics Conference this weekend. So we are grateful for him. If you could also give him a round of applause. Now, before we formally begin our proceedings, I want to just tell you what you are going to be in for. Uh, we are going to have a time where there will be two 20-minute presentations. And these will be timed. You'll notice that I have a beautiful captain's bell here. Listen to this. When that bell rings, our speaker needs to finish up what he is saying, and we want to be tight with the time so that we can be respectful to the program. And I've always wanted to use that bell. Uh, we're going to have two 20-minute presentations, and that will be followed by two 10-minute rebuttals. We will then move into a 30-minute section where we are going to have some cross-examination and dialogue. Each speaker will be given 15 minutes to lead those questions, and that, of course, will also be timed. And then we will conclude with two five-minute closing remarks. And where possible at the end of the program, if you have any questions, um, I'm sure where available, the speakers would love to be able to talk to you. And we will advise after this event in terms of where and when you can find the video and audio recordings of today. And what I would like to encourage everybody is when you are hearing the presentations, if you could please show your respect by holding back any applause or comment um, until the end of the presentation, we want to respect both of the speakers and give them the ability to be able to communicate these things clearly as we respectfully listen on. I'd like to begin by first of all asking uh, Dr. James White if he could come and bring our opening presentation. Thank you, Dr. White. All right, well, it is indeed a pleasure to be with you. I am very glad that uh, Abdullah was able to make it through that wonderful, I'm, I'm discovering that Australians have interesting difficulties with traffic. Uh, it uh, seems a little bit like the United States uh, in, in, that, in that way, but I'm very happy that you all were able to be here this afternoon. And uh, I wasn't exactly sure what direction to go in our discussion on the subject of the Bible and the Quran. Abdullah was very kind to uh, take this uh, discussion on very, uh, in a very relatively short period of time. And so we didn't want to do anything that was completely out of the norm. And of course, I've done many dialogues before on the subject of the Bible and uh, the Quran. Uh, but uh, thankfully, I think it was only about four or five days ago, uh, you had a, a dialogue. Was that at Monash University? Was it Wednesday? Something along that, that, those lines. Um, with a Christian on the sub, this very same subject. So I watched that and said, okay, there we go. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to be a little bit more focused that way because when you talk about comparing two scriptures, let's, let's keep a few things in mind. Not everyone knows the historical backgrounds of these uh, two particular books, but when you're looking at the Bible, you're talking about a collection of writings by more than 40 authors that was collected over 1,500 years. 
And so written in multiple languages, uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament, but of course Hebrew went through a, a lot of change and development during the lengthy period of time during which what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh uh, was being written. Uh, there are about 12 chapters of Aramaic as well. Um, and then you have Koine Greek in the New Testament um, and a much shorter time period for the writing of that. Of that. But you have very, very, very ancient material in the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. Uh, less ancient once you get to the minor prophets uh, who are up to about 400 years for the time of Christ. Then the New Testament is written in a very short period of time, relatively speaking. Um, and then you have, uh, with the Quran, you're coming 600 years later. This is in historical, um, let's not get into the, the d debate today on the eternality of the Quran. I just did a, a debate with uh, Yusuf Ismail in uh, South Africa on that subject about two months ago, if you want to take a look at that. Um, but at least as far as historical appearance, uh, the Quran comes about 600 years after that. So Quran is not actually an ancient work in that sense. Uh, because it's coming right at the beginning of the medieval period. It wouldn't classically be identified as one of the works of antiquity like the New Testament would be. And so the Quran is also significantly smaller. It's only 14% the length of the entire Bible, about 53% the length of the New Testament as far as the number of words are concerned. And so it's, it's a much smaller volume and it's a, a relatively much more recent volume. So in other words, it only had to go through uh, about 800 years of handwritten transmission uh, before the invention of printing in the West, uh, whereas the New Testament has to go through about 1,400 years and portions of the Old Testament multiple thousands of years. And so when we're comparing these two volumes, we're comparing very, very different uh, works. One is one, one language, and we're told one author versus a collection of over 40 authors uh, collected over 1,500 years in comparison to about 12. So very, very different things. And so I have often asked in my dialogues and discussions with Muslims when criticism is made of the Old or New Testaments, well, we need to use the same standards. We need to have, as the Quran refers to, equal scales. We need to use the same standards of evidence and reasoning and so on and so forth. And so when we do that, when we talk about the Bible and the Quran, we have to be very, very careful. Most Muslims and Christians just simply look at it as a volume on the table and uh, do not recognize the historical reality of how these books came together. And a lot of Christians are not aware of the historical reality of how, uh, for example, the New Testament came together. It's very important to recognize, I think, if we want to seek to compare, and if any of you have uh, my book, uh, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran, do you have that uh, book? Uh, you can get an autographed one, yes. Yeah, so we'll try to, try to work that out. But, um, but, you do, but you have read it? No, I haven't. Oh, no. Okay, well, you may lose your copy today. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, in my book, in chapters 9 and 11, I deal with this specific issue. You could have known everything I was going to say if, oh. you, just had, if you just had my book. I'll send you on YouTube. It's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so what is really important for both sides to understand is that one of the fundamental differences between the Bible and the Quran, other than the things we've already mentioned here, that is multiple authors, different kinds of literature, uh, in, in the Old and New Testaments, you have apocalyptic and poetry and so on and so forth. And there are a couple of different forms of various of the surahs in the, in the Quran, but not nearly as wide a variety of literature as you have in the context of the Bible. But the most important thing, I think, that would help advance the conversations that we, that we need to be having between our communities and by the way, if I could just say this, I'm really hoping that the conversations with young men like Abdullah will in the future lead to an advancement of our conversations between our communities to important issues. I'm afraid that in the past, very often our conversations have gotten stuck into certain ruts um, and don't necessarily result in a lot of increased understanding of what either side actually believes. I want to see that advancement uh, in, in the future because it can be done with respect. Uh, we don't have to be at each other's throats. We, we will always, as long as Islam remains Islam and Christianity remains Christianity, be at disagreement with one another. 
Surah 112, Ayah 3, Lem yelid wa lem yelid, he begets not, nor, nor is he begotten. If that is directly in reference to Christianity, and I think that it is, we will always have reason to be at disagreement on key issues. But that doesn't mean that we cannot respect one another and that we cannot engage in this type of dialogue in a meaningful fashion. And I think the whole world needs a whole lot more of the dialogue rather than the fighting, personally. And so I'd love to see an advancement of the topics. And here's my contribution to that. The fundamental difference between the Quran and the New Testament, let's focus upon the New Testament because the, the, the history of the Old Testament is so long and so far back in antiquity that it's very, very difficult. The fundamental difference is between what is called a free transmission of a text and a controlled transmission of a text. Now, what does that mean? In the New Testament, the older of the two documents, and the longer and the multi-authored document, you have multiple writers writing at multiple times to multiple audiences. So the Apostle Paul, he didn't write all his letters in the same place. The Gospels probably weren't written in the same place. Uh, the book of Revelation was not written in the same place as other books. So you have multiple authors, multiple times, writing to multiple audiences. That meant that certain churches, for example, if you received a letter from the Apostle Paul, then you would let copies of that be made and they'd be distributed to other churches, but you'd have that one. You'd keep that one particularly to yourself. And eventually collections of those letters would be made and collections of the Gospels were made and eventually those were put together with the letters of Paul and, and you have a process going on. And it, the important thing is it's not a straight line. You don't have someone writing the New Testament and then a copy is made of the New Testament, then a copy is made of the New Testament, then a copy is made of the New Testament. You have multiple so or origination sources and hence you have multiple lines of transmission going up through history until they start being collected together. Now, why is that important? It's extremely important because what it means is there was never, ever a time in the history of the New Testament when any man or group of men could control what was in the New Testament. Oh, I know that's against YouTube. <laughs> and if you get your scholarship from YouTube, you'll believe anything uh, on any subject there is. But there was never a time historically when any one man or group of men controlled the New Testament. Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, Constantine, that is all absurd from any historical perspective whatsoever. It could not have happened. There is no way that Constantine could have gathered up all the copies of the Gospels and made wholesale changes. He couldn't have found all of them. We have manuscripts today that had already been buried in the sands of Egypt before Constantine was ever born. He wouldn't have had access to those things. And hence, if he did make changes later on, once we find those earlier manuscripts, there would be huge differences between them. But the reality is, as we began finding the papyri, they're called the papyri, we started really finding them in mass in the 1930s. Uh, the British had stolen them from Egypt uh, long before during the colonial period and dragged them back to London. And as we discovered these papyri, did we discover a new New Testament, some new message? No, not at all. They confirmed the accuracy of the manuscripts that we already had, the great unseals like Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, Washingtonianus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So uh, that kind of editing could not take place in a free transmission of the text. Now, the result of free transmission of the text is something called textual variation because for the first 300 years of the church, there's persecution especially between 250 and 313, there's empire-wide persecution. The Romans are trying to destroy the New Testament, and so the Christians are having to make a lot of copies of the New Testament so to make sure that people have the scriptures. And they didn't require you to be a professionally trained scribe to make a copy. If you wanted to make a copy of, of 1 Peter for your church, because your church didn't have a copy of 1 Peter, they didn't say, let me see your uh, scribal uh, accreditations card, please, before you, we allow you to do that. No, you were allowed to make a copy. And so when we look at those early papyri, we see varying levels of skills and, of, and clarity of writing and so on and so forth. And the result is something called textual variation. If I took a handwritten document 
and gave it to everybody in the front row and asked them to copy it and give it to everybody in the second row and then they gave their copy to the third row. By the time it got back to the back, we would have a number of differences in what was originally given. But if we could find your copy and your copy and your copy and your copy on the way and compare them together, we'd have a very good ability to reconstruct what was given to the people in the first row. That's similar to what we have in looking at the transmission of any ancient text, but especially in regards to the New Testament. That is the result of the free transmission of the text. The cost is textual variance, which we need to study to this day, but the good thing is there could never be any substantial editing or changing of any of those documents that would not stand out in clear display as earlier and earlier manuscripts have been found. That gives us the free transmission gives you the highest level of confidence. The more lines of transmission that you have, the higher the level of confidence that you have. We have over 5,000, almost 5,800 fragments of the New Testament in Greek, plus you add in the Latin, Syriac, Boharic, Coptic, etc., etc. We have over 25,000 handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament. As Bart Ehrman said in the debate we did in 2009, the New Testament has the earliest attestation of any work of antiquity. No other work of antiquity comes close. Every other work written contemporaneously with the New Testament, the average amount of time between the first manuscript that we have in the extant now and when it was written is between five and 900 years. For the New Testament, we have fragments, for example, the Gospel of John, P52, a little credit card fragment, uh, from John chapter 18, verses 31 to 34 and 37 to 38, is from around 125. So four times earlier than any other work of antiquity that would be con contemporaneous with the New Testament. That's what we're dealing with. Now, what is a controlled transmission? A controlled transmission is Sahel Bakari, volume 6, pages 509 and 510 which I will allow Abdullah to narrate for you because he did earlier when he gave the presentation just a few days ago. Specifically, a controlled transmission is when there is an external authority or power that is involved in revision or control of an official text and has the power to actually enforce that. And so fundamentally, when you have Uthman, uh, specifically creating an official version of the text and then sending that official version to the major Islamic cities and saying, this is the Quran that you are to use and anything else is to be destroyed. And you have people like Ubay ibn Kab and Ibn Masud uh, who are going, well, Kab not so much, but uh, especially Ibn Masud going, no, 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 no. Muhammad said, I was one of the people you come to for the Quran, uh, and I'm not giving mine up. And so there's, there's dispute. But when you have the governmental authority saying, this is the version you are to use, destroy anything else, that is not a free transmission of the text. That is a controlled transmission of the text. Now, for most folks, you'd rather have the controlled one. Now, I don't know about you, I do not want the United States government approved version of the Bible. That, that concerns me greatly. Uh, it, it really, really does. Um, but what if it's a religious government? What if it's the successor of Muhammad? Then why not? That would be a good thing to have. And a lot of people don't like the fact that in the margins of your Bible, you know, you, you, it's in little teeny tiny print, but it says right over there, some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that. And if you're a Christian, you've got to admit there were times you looked at it and said, I, I don't know if I like that. You should be very, very thankful that that is in the margin of your Bible. You should be very thankful you have that kind of information available to you. Because the controlled transmission of a text can only give you confidence back to the last revision of that particular text. So let me give an illustration. Some of you may remember the um, uh, movies with Indiana Jones years ago. I'm dating myself here. Uh, some of you watched some of the oldies channels. Um, and you remember the search for the Holy Grail. And they, 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 the Holy Grail's in this, remember the cave with the dude that had been sitting around in there for 700 years? That was a really boring job. And uh, didn't even have cable. And, uh, and I'm not sure how you live for 700 years and a Nazi can shoot you and you die immediately. But anyway, it's, the believability was sort of rough. But, but a lot of people would like that, let's, let's just have one 
version of the New Testament and it's kept in one place and if we need to know, we go ask the guy who lives for 700 years and protects it. That way we'd have no notes, uh, we'd have no, no concerns whatsoever, except for one thing. How do you know what he's been doing in there for 700 years? You've got no way to check. Maybe he decided he could do a better job than the original writers did. You have no way of knowing because unless you have a free transmission of the text and hence can compare many, many manuscripts, if you only got one, you have to trust that whoever produced that one got it exactly right. And so what if Uthman was successful? What if he produces the final edition and he sends it out and says everything else needs to be destroyed and everything else was destroyed. It wasn't. That's the, the, one of the issues we need to discuss. You have this on a manuscript, uh, papyri and uh, manuscript finds, things like that. But what if he was successful? How far back then could you go in the transmission of a controlled text only back to the last successful revision? Now I remember I, I debated Adnan Rashid on this subject in London a number of years ago. And he said, hey, as long as we can get back to Uthman, that's perfectly fine with me. So there you go. As long as that's your ultimate authority, there you go. But you're admitting we can't go back to the original. We can only go back to the last revision in a controlled transmission of a text. Now, when you have controlled transmission, you're going to have much less in the way of textual variation. There are textual variants in manuscripts of the Quran. That is not even a questionable thing. I'm sure that's not going to be disputed to, uh, today. That's been admitted by many of my opponents. Uh, easily documented. But you're not going to have nearly as many because you don't have nearly as many copies being made. So what's the situation we face today? One of the things that we need to, we need to understand is that issue of the free, free transmission versus control transmission. And then, it's a little bit unfair, but we have critical editions of the Greek New Testament today. I have one over there I can talk to you about a little bit later on. Uh, we have the Nessian, the 28th edition. We're working on what's called the ECM, the Editio Critico Mayor. It's supposed to be done by 2030. Uh, it's going to be huge, probably about 40 volumes long. Uh, in regards to the, the manuscript evidence the New Testament, it's going to be awesome to have all that information available to us. Um, but we have many critical editions available to us with the manuscripts listed and so on and so forth. There is not yet a critical edition of the Quran. They're working on it. There is a, there is a project undergoing. But as far as having a even close to complete catalog of all the manuscripts, their contents, collations of the manuscripts, uh, the availability of information. The critical study of the Quran is in its infancy in comparison to the New Testament. And that means the conclusions that we come to in this type of a dialogue and discussion have to be that they can't be final. I'm not going to be one of those people that says, and as a result, this is what you must believe. No, um, there's more information to come. But the reality is that one side has significantly more data from which to draw than the other side does as to the history of their text, which is a little bit interesting given the fact that the Quran is 600 years younger and hence was written much closer to the time period of the modern, modern time as well. Those are issues we'll have to be getting into. Hopefully that wasn't too much information too fast, but it's a good foundation to get us started. We've got a lot more time to talk about it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm sorry you didn't get to I needed that. to ring that bell. <laughs> Thank you, James. I'd like to now begin a 20-minute presentation as Abdullah brings this one to us now. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for providing this opportunity and also uh, seeing James White uh, in real life. I've only seen him on, uh, on the computer so far, and I look forward to reading his book. Uh, I echo a lot of the sentiments that he expressed in terms of uh, dialogue between uh, either faith uh, and the nature of respect and reflection, um, not necessarily to uh, answer questions, but perhaps to get us to think a little bit more deeper uh, about our own beliefs and our own foundations for them, for both sides. So. I'll begin my presentation. I'm, uh, you might actually get an opportunity to ring this bell on me because um, I've got a, quite a few things to run through, but uh, let's go into it. So have you, have you ever thought about how religious scriptures, uh, how the religious scriptures that we have today have been passed on throughout history? And thanks to innovations like the printing press in the world that we live in, which allows for the mass distribution of information, 
we don't have to really worry about the loss of our religious texts or because of the printing. We only have to account for a small portion of our history of, of most of our religious texts because of that, which span thousands of years. The vast majority of religious texts today have been passed down to us through scribal traditions, whereby manuscripts are copied word for word, hand by hand, using materials such as ink and leather. And so the question here is, is, is this method of preserving information reliable? So have a think about communications in the modern world, such as email, text messages. Have, have you ever sent an email or a text message that contains spelling or grammar mistakes? We, uh, and even with the benefit of uh, modern computers, phones, even with professional media outlets and uh, spelling and grammar, uh, spell check and whatnot. Now imagine if you have a copy of an entire book with hundreds of pages by hand, and it's been copied by hand and only with paper and ink without relying on any modern technology. Now, naturally, I think it's reasonable to agree, and I think we both agree, that it would be probably filled with some mistakes. And so this is exactly what we find when we compare manuscript copies of religious texts from the past. They're filled with many spelling mistakes, missing words, sentences. There have even been uh, scribes that have made intentional changes to suit a particular agenda. And I'm not going into conspiracy theories, although the, some of them are interesting. Um, it was easy to do this without most people realizing because literacy rates uh, in the ancient past was really, really low. And there were very few scribes. Now extend this copying process over hundreds of years and even a thousand years. Now, you can imagine how this text will change over a long period of time. Accidental or intentional or changes will eventually gradually creep in. Now, imagine if you had this task of evaluating all these written copies with all their differences. You would have to compare each of them to the original, word by word, line by line. Now, this would be an extremely time-consuming task, but if you had enough time or enough people helping you, eventually you could work out which copies were the most accurate compared to the original. Now imagine if you had to perform this task of evaluating all these vari variations, but this time you didn't possess the original to compare it against. It would almost be impossible to determine the accuracy. This brings us to another major problem with relying with manuscripts only um, and the preservation of information. Over time they can be lost, they can be damaged, and so we don't always know or have access to the original or even the early copies of the originals. And so therefore, we lose the ability to determine which of the copies we possess is the most accurate. Now that, we now that we have a background of the transmission of ancient texts, we can have a better appreciation of the transmission of the New Testament. The earliest uh, physical manuscript, which was mentioned by um, uh, Dr. White, is the New Testament manuscript known as P40, P52, dated by the earliest part of uh, the, new uh, the second century, nearly 100 years after Jesus. It was from the Gospel of John, and it's about the size of a credit card. That's all we have. The, first, uh, the, fir the front contains the first seven lines from the Gospel of John, and the back contains the seven lines from verses 37 and 38, both in Greek. Now, the earliest copy of the New Testament in, is Codex Sinaiticus, and that was dated in the fourth century. Now, to trace this timeline. That's 300 years after Jesus. And so just about how many New Testament manuscripts are there? And how different are they from one another? The original language of the New Testament is in Greek. And this is the language that most ancient manuscripts are in. There is almost 6,000, we had a number of 25,000 in total of New Testament manuscripts, but no two pages are identical. This is according to the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, and I quote, um, there is no one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. And so the famous Alexandrian scholar Origen was aware of the scale of the variants of the New Testament as early as the third century. And he says, the differences among the, uh, the manuscripts of the Gospels have become great, either through the negligence of some of the copyists or through the perverse audacity of others. They either neglect to check over what they have transcribed or in the process of checking, they lengthen or shorten what they, uh, as they please. The third century, Codes, and then the Codex uh, Venaticus, one of the oldest surviving manuscripts of the New Testament has a fascinating scribal comment in the margin which provides great insight into the variants from this point of view, from the copyist. And it says, some of the New Testament, uh, present, uh, some of the New Testament presents a bewildering number of variant readings across the manuscripts. For example, Colossians 2.2 with 15 variations. So this raises an interesting question. Which version of the New Testament is inspired uh, as the word of God? And and since there are so many uh, uh, variants in existence, how do we choose? 
And so faced with a massive number of variant readings, how do Christian scholars go about determining what may be the word of God and may be the word of man? So let's take an example here. Luke 10, uh, 10, uh, Luke 10, 1, yeah? And we, I'll provide the example from the NIV, uh, the RSV as well. So in, in the NIV, um, it's, uh, it says, uh, that verse, after the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. That's in the NIV. In the RSV, it's, I quote, after the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them uh, and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was to come. So as you can see, the editors have two, there's two different versions of the Bible and two different readings. Yeah? It's, on one hand, it says 70. On the other hand, it says 72. But in the, New, uh, in the original New Testament, so which one is the original New Testament? 70 or 72? So Bruce Metzger, a Christian expert in the Greek biblical manuscripts and is widely recognized as one of the most influential uh, 20th century New Testament scholars, this is what he had to say about the evaluation of this textual problem in the wake of Luke 10, 10 1. He says, and I quote, the, the external evidence is almost evenly divided. The factors bringing the evaluation of internal evidence, whether uh, involving tr uh, transcriptional or intrinsic pos uh, probabilities, are singular, elusive. It is likely that there in most, most of the early manuscripts, the numeral was written in letters of the alphabet. It was easy, therefore, for either number to be accidentally altered. So evenly balanced, there's two probabilities. Now, more or less, as you can see, the criteria here, and this is just one example, uh, that has been developed by textual scholars depend wholly on probabilities. Often the textual critics must weigh each set of probabilities against each other. The range and complexity of the textual data are so great that no mechanically divided set of rules can be applied with math mathematical precision. So each one of those variant readings need to be considered in itself and not judged according to a, a basic rule of thumb. And so Bruce Metzger con uh, concludes by saying the following about the evaluation of the readings. He says, by, by way of conclusion, let it be emphasized again that there is no single manuscript and no one group of, uh, of manuscripts that a textual critic may follow mechanically. All known witnesses of the New Testament are, to a greater or lesser extent, mixed texts. And he goes on for a larger quote, and if anyone, everyone's interested, uh, I can go into this. And so answering the question whether the Bible is the word of God, we have, to ha we have the difficult task of identifying which, which version may be the word of God. And so as we've seen, ultimately there's fallible editors that decide what goes into the New Testament, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Now, we can appreciate why, the, uh, why there may be different versions of the Bible in existence today. And scholars of the Bible, uh, those who are experts in sifting through the huge number of variants that exist in the manuscript tradition, can't agree on which copies are the most accurate. This is because they have the tough task of estimating which copies are closest to the original without possessing the original to compare. I'll say that again. Their task is to, com uh, is to, is their task is to come as close as they can to the original because they do not have the original to compare it. So with each version of the Bible that exists, there's a patchwork of different copies combined together, and this represents what a particular scholar or a group of scholars estimate as the closest match to the original. Therefore, with the, new te the text law of the New Testament, there, we've relied on a copy, uh, the manual copying of preservation. And so with this, we, we rely on estimates. And we can't say with 100% that what we have today is however the accurate or, represent, uh, or representation of the original. Now you might say, hey, so what are the theological consequences of the New Testament variances? Yeah, spelling errors, sentences, passages, um, you know, does it matter at all? Now, I wanted to uh, press on about three different, um, three different examples. Actually, four. Make that four, if I've got time. Now, uh, I'll r run through them, and hopefully maybe in the uh, dialogue that we have in the next segment, I can go into them deeper. Otherwise, I won't get an opportunity to go through the Quran. Um, the first one is did, uh, John, uh, 1 John 5, 7. Yeah? For, for, their, for their three that bear uh, record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This is an often uh, quoted uh, um, passage to demonstrate um, the Trinity, although the Trinity is larger than just a sequence of, um, uh, of uh, persons. Um, Co-equality -equal, co 
um, uh, is, is, is core to it. So anyway, uh, we can discuss that a, a bit later, I'm sure. Um, uh, Dr. White's got many, dis uh, many debates on the Trinity. Now this verse um, mentions, supposedly mentions the Trinity. Now, it used to be present in all Bibles. It remains in, in, in some versions, but in the King James Version today, there's, a, a, there's an interesting um, quote. However, the editors of the uh, uh, modern versions of the Bible, such as the RSV and the NIV, have removed this particular quote. Now, compare 1 John 5, 7 um, uh, in these different versions of the Bible. Notice that in a version, uh, in verse 7, now if you've, got the, uh, if you've got the RSV or NIV, pull it out and have a look. Um, I don't have a projector on me here, um, but there's a slide on this. So notice how uh, verse 7 in the RSV is different to verse 7 in the K KJV. The RSV does not contain the mention of the threeness. Uh, also notice that the verse 7 in the NIV is different from not only the KJV, but also uh, the RSV. The NIV does not contain mention of the threeness. Now, here is the NIV quote regarding, um, regarding that verse. Um, in the late manuscripts of the, Vulgate, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Vulgate, testify in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that testify on earth. And, this, and then, there's a, then, then there's a bracket not found in the original Greek, Greek manuscripts before the 6th century. So if you're an auditor, you could only go, you could only go up to the 6th century. You've got six centuries to account for, which you, uh, which you, 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 can't, you can't determine without any um, level of accuracy. And this is a, this is a quote that, um, that people use for the Trinity, very, very core. And so without this verse, there's no mention of God's threeness in the Bible. So one has to wonder if the Trinity is even a genuine doctrine in the, of the Bible in this case. Why is there only one explicit mention uh, of God's threeness in, uh, and only in later editions? It seems that it has to be inserted into the Bible in order to lend support for this particular doctrine. So that's the first example. The second example is the story of the, the adulterous woman. Now, um, and to re refresh your memories, as the quote goes, um, let any of you who is uh, without sin be the first to, cut, uh, to throw the stone at her. How often have you heard this in sermons? Now, this section of the Gospel of John, verses 7, 53, and 8, 11, is a famous story of the adulterous woman who is about to be stoned because of a charge of adultery. Now, in these verses, Jesus was questioned about her, uh, her punishment and utters the famous words, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Now, this whole story is another later edition in the, New Test uh, in, the, uh, in the earliest New Testaments, and it's not found until the 5th century. And the, and the vast majority of, uh, of those prior to the 8th century lack this story. And so here's, a, here's an interesting footnote regarding the ver this verse in the NIV. It says, the earliest manuscripts and many of the ancient witnesses do not have this in John. A few manuscripts include this verse, but it, uh, wholly or only in part. And so Christian, Christian theology teaches, Jesus, uh, teaches that Jesus came to do away with the Old Testament for punishment of crimes uh, of passion such as adultery. And these verses are commonly cited by Christians to support this claim. And so without these verses... We find no other examples of Jesus not following the Old Testament laws and dealing with the punishment of the crime. Now, they're two, I think they're two very core doctrinal um, consequences uh, of the variation that exists. And there's a couple more that I'll quickly gloss over, but there's, there's, there more, hopefully we have time for it. And the third one, the third one is, is um, uh, the ending of Mark, right? And the shortest ending in Mark is found in uh, some of the oldest complete copies of the New Testament in, uh, in Venaticus and also Sinaiticus, which is still three and a half centuries after Jesus died. That's the earliest we have. Yeah? And they stop at verse 16.8. Uh, and most of the other later manuscripts contain some additional verses and Mark 16.9-20, which are not always the same, seem to have an added, added to the gospel at a later uh, point in time. And so in these additional verses that mention the believing Christians will be able to survive handling snakes and deadly poison. Uh, you might have seen YouTube videos around that. I'm not sure if this church does that. Um, I don't think so. And so it has, it has consequences, yeah? And the, third, and the fourth one is the role of women in, church, in the church, yeah? Women, uh, and, and uh, I'll, I'll quote Corinthians, yeah? Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but they must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. 
for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Now, for many centuries, women had not been allowed to lead or to teach in the churches based on these verses. However, there is strong evidence to suggest that these verses are not in the original Paul's writings, but they were added as later scribes. And so for a start, these verses seem to contradict what Paul wrote earlier anyway. And he says, but every woman who prays or, or prophesies with, uh, uh, with her head uncovered dishonors her head and is the same as having her head shaven. Since it's quite clear that Paul has no issue with women openly prophesying and praying, it makes no sense that he'd immediately follow it up with what he said about silence and speaking. And so they're, they're the four points of uh, one of the consequences of the particular variation. So the variation exists in terms of words, sentences, some passages, and but in many ways, those core differences have got core doctrinal problems in them, right? And how do we determine that? Is it disciples? Is it apostles? Is it Jesus? Who's deciding this? And uh, and if we, if we in, hopefully in the next couple of segments, we'll unveil that the people who are deciding this are church fathers, who are not disciples, who are not eyewitnesses, who are not connected to Jesus, they're disconnected by many centuries. And our, our, our closest auditing trail is at the best Codex Sinaiticus, which is about three and a half centuries after Jesus died, right? That's the best. And after that, we have thousands and thousands of, um, uh, of manuscripts. Prior to that, the closest we can get is a credit card size P, uh, P52 of Gospel of John. That's as close as we can. We don't have the, we don't have the originals of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Now, the transmission of the Quran. We might say, what about the Quran? The preservation, perhaps, was, uh, was, uh, could have been pro- uh, compromised based on what um, uh, James said. But the author of the Quran makes a very, very bold claim that this doesn't exist in the Bible uh, specifically. And particularly on the point of uh, the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of them claim to be inspired anyway. But the, the Quran makes a very clear uh, statement here. And I quote in uh, Surah 15, chapter, uh, sorry, Chapter 15, um, verse 9, we have sent down the Quran ourselves, and we ourselves will guard it. This is God's promise that God blessed his final revelation with the Quran with something that is not bestowed on any prior scriptures. He promised to protect and preserve it from any corruption. You might be wondering about why this is such a bold claim uh, and how it could be true in light of, um, you know, about the, uh, in light of consistent corruption of previous religious scriptures throughout history, including the New Testament. So unlike this scripture, these scriptures, the primary means of preserving the Quran has been and always was through mes- memorization. And, uh, and, the, and the Quran reminds us of this in chapter 54, verse 17. And we have certainly made the Quran easy for remembrance. So, so there, any who will remember. And in memorization is really practical in preserving Quran. The reason being is because it's got a unique style that is easy to memorize, like poetry. And so have a think back when you were at school. The, you've probably forgotten the finer details of science of, or, 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 um, or any of those boring subjects that you have, mathematics and physics. But um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of maths, by the way. Um, this is because we haven't used this knowledge after we've left school, for example. And human beings naturally forget things. Um, but how often is it that you can recall a, a nursery rhyme or the words of lyrics of a song, like just like that, right? And you haven't heard it for ages. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, was tasked by God with memorizing, transmitting, and explaining the verses of the Quran to, the Mus- to Muslims as they were revealed by God to him through the spirit of angel Gabriel. Um, and in turn, Muslims who had learned the Quran directly from the Prophet himself were known as the companions passed on what was memorized to the neighboring tribes and nations. So see the difference here. It's the companions. It's the, the companions who not only heard the Quran in person, they memorized it off the Prophet himself. And not one companion, not two companions, but thousands of them memorized it for word for word, whilst or simultaneously later on was also being written down. Now, this is very attested to by, I've got a, couple, a minute or two? And that's it, that's it. All right. It's attested by Orientalist, Orientalist scholars as well, and we'll get into it in the next segment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdullah, and thank you for letting me ring the bell. I really wanted to do that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, James now to bring the first rebuttal, and this will be 10 minutes.
The problem, of course, with debates is it would take 30 minutes to adequately engage each of the subjects that were just, uh, that were just raised. That's, that's the problem. I'd like to uh, begin by uh, giving Abdullah some uh, gifts. Sorry, I'll, I'll give you some, some later on. But um, here is my, uh, my book, Whatever Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. And also, uh, Bruce Metzger is a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament uh, that he was just quoting from. I don't know if you actually have the whole volume, but you will know. So thank you. All right, um, I won't spend a whole lot of time on each one of the variants because those of you who listen to my program know that only two weeks ago I spent about 90 minutes on the Kama Yohanium. Uh, that is 1 John 5, 7. I went through all the manuscript evidence. Uh, what it was said, for example, that it used to be present in all Bibles, that is simply not true, obviously. Uh, it is an insertion of the Greek text that the earliest testimony we have amongst Greek manuscripts is from uh, the 15th century approximately. Uh, I have examined the actual manuscript that forced Desiderius Erasmus to put it into his third edition of his Novum Instrumentum uh, in um, uh, the Trinity College's reading room in Dublin, uh, Ireland, uh, Codex Monfortianus. Uh, it was not written by John. It is not part of the Greek manuscript tradition. It is a, a Latin gloss that first appears in the 5th and 6th centuries, went into the Latin Vulgate, uh, became popular. It was never used by the, for example, church fathers at Nicaea to prove the doctrine of the Trinity. I've written an entire book on the Trinity, never quoted 1 John 5, 7, because it is not a proof text for the Trinity in that sense in any way, shape, or form. So we are not dependent upon it. Uh, it has been well known by all scholars, uh, anyone familiar with the New Testament, that it is a later edition. So when it is said, it's a quote, people used to prove the Trinity, not by people who know their Bible. It may be used by others, but it is not used by those who actually understand the foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Every talk I give on the subject of New Testament reliability, I make sure everybody understands that there are two major texts in the New Testament that involve a major block of texts that are variants. That is the Pericope Adultery in John 7, 53 through 8, 11, uh, and the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. There is significantly earlier evidence for the longer ending of Mark than there is for the Pericope Adultery, which first appears in Codex Beze Cantabrigiensis in the fifth century. Uh, which is a very unreliable manuscript. I call it the living Bible of the early church. Uh, not only that, but the Pericope Adultery appears in three different places in the Gospel of John and two places in Luke in the manuscript of tradition. That is a story that was looking for a place to land. Again, scholars are well aware of this. Uh, you do not base any dogmatic teaching upon a, a textual variant, so it's not the basis of anything in regards to Jesus and the Old Testament law or any of those things. Uh, these are well-known variants. The evidence is all right here. So anyone who wants to go out can purchase. This is the Nessie Holland edition of the Greek New Testament. You can buy the United Bible Societies. These are all available digitally. They're all available on phones and tablets and everything else today. And you can look those up, and there's the bottom of the page or all the var variants laid out for you. Now, this has more variants than the UBS text does. How many variants are there? Well, it depends on whether you count just simply, for example, is there, if, if there's a difference in one single letter, uh, or whether you're talking about variants that actually could be original and actually change the meaning of the text. If, it, if you're talking about bulk variants, including spelling and everything else, in the about three million pages of New Testament manuscripts in Greek, there's about 400,000 variants. That's a lot. But when you boil it down to what could be original and could actually be explained to someone who doesn't read Greek, there's between 1,500 and 2,000. Now, here's the issue to understand. Everything that was given to us by the apostles of Jesus Christ is right here. It's either in the text or in the notes. We have not lost any of the original readings. Now, there is nothing like this for the Quran. The only reason that Abdullah can raise issues about textual variations is because we have enough information about the early texts of the New Testament to identify them. Look at the Arabic text of the Quran that most everybody in this room, if you're a Muslim, reads from. Are there any notes at the bottom of the page? Are there any notes on the side of the page? Nothing. It was created in 1924 in Cairo, Egypt. It was not done by a bunch of scholars. And yet it has become worldwide, not completely, Pakistan has its own reading, so on and so forth, but it has become worldwide the standard. And yet it doesn't come from doing meaningful manuscript study. It is just simply printed in that way, and there are no notes 
So the reason that we're talking about variants in the New Testament rather than variants in the Quran is because there are only a very few sources of information about the variants in the Quran. And so when you're reading the Arabic text, you don't know if that's a variant or not. You've got no information. There, I mean, the top copy printing has a, has a chart with a few variants in that, and you, you can go dig up some of the books on the Sa'ana manuscripts and discover the, the large number of variations that are found in those. But the fact is, there's, this doesn't exist in Islam yet. So which is better, to know the history and have all of the data in front of you, or to just have an established text and not even know what its history is? and say, well, it was memorized. Well, the problem is, in the very narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari, what was the primary reason when people approached uh, Uthman to do his revision? There were differences in the recitation amongst the people in Iraq and Sham. So there were differences. So how do we know what, the, what those differences were? When, when that collation was done, verses were found that were not in the original one that were done uh, a, a number of years before that in the original manuscript. Well, not original manuscript, the original collation manuscript. There were verses that were found, a, a verse in Surah 9 that was found at that time. What other verses? We don't know because we don't have enough information. And so when, right now, we are living in a day where something tremendous is happening. And I, I do not have time to explain this. But right now, when we talk about the difference here, uh, I am actually doing a PhD program. Uh, my doctoral advisor did his PhD under Metzger. So you've already heard Metzger mentioned, so you, you get, get the idea. And what I am specifically focusing upon is something called CBGM, Coherence Based Genealogical Method. You can go online, it's only available for Acts and the General Epistles so far. There's, it's, this is an ongoing project. You can go online for any one of these variants, and you are able to. I know only a few of you can see this, but click on any one of these manuscripts. Here are the relationships of manuscripts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are wide open in our recognition of the existence of variation, but the point is we have hundreds of manuscripts upon which to be able to determine the range of even possibilities for any one of them. There are numerous scribal errors. For example, there's something called homo italiaton. When you're copying a, a document, and in your language there are common endings to words, T-I-O-N, E-S, I-N-G, these are common English endings to words. It is very easy for a scribe, upon writing a word that ends with T-I-O-N, when looking back at what they're copying, they find another word that ends with T-I-O-N, they think it's the same word, but actually it's a few words down the road, and they inadvertently skip what's in between. Now, if we only had one manuscript, or if we had a revision of manuscripts, then we wouldn't know what the original was. But we have hundreds of manuscripts, and we're able to compare them. And because we have multiple lines of transmission, you can go, oh, look at that. For example, in 1 John 3, 1, if you compare the King James with modern translations, the King James doesn't have a phrase, and such we are. What, what great a love the Father has shown us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. That and such we are is not in the majority of Greek manuscripts, but we know that it's what John originally wrote. Why? Because it's homo teleuton. It is an example of seeing similar endings and inadvertently the eye skips over and you lost two words, chi esmen, that's all it was. So we recognize scribal habits, we are open about these things, and we have the biggest, oldest manuscript tradition of any work of antiquity. We can't even begin to have this discussion about the Quran because we don't have that information. And by the way, when you say, well, you know, you've, you've got Sinaiticus and then you've just got that one scrap, that ignores all the rest of the papyri. I am working on uh, papyrus P45. P45 contains sections of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. It's the only early manuscript we have that contains those particular books. It goes between 200 and 220. Um, it has major, major portions of that text, and it's one of just many that we can compare with one another that go into that time period between P52. Not only that, we have something called P, uh, P75, which when it agrees with Sinaiticus goes back to as early as P52. There is much more information that we actually have. My point is, because of the free transmission, we can look at all this. We've got all the data right here. Where's the, where's the corresponding Quran? It doesn't exist. And we're being told, well, it's because it was memorized. Documentation is something we can examine. 
A dead person's memory, we cannot. That's a major difference. Thank you. Is it 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Awesome. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. White, for the book. Um, I need, I'll get your autograph uh, after the debate. Um, so uh, I, think, I think a lot of things were left to be said because I missed out on the last bit, but um, more or less, uh, uh, I'll cover the end of, I've got 10 minutes, so I think I've got enough time. Uh, what Dr. White's doing is he's, he's demonstrating uh, a lack of, uh, he's, he's trying to explain um, more or less is uh, through titling it a free transmission, um, that trying to put pieces of the puzzle back together, right? Um, and there is, uh, I only got up to the purely the oral transmission for the Islamic uh, um, uh, or for the Quranic uh, um, uh, understanding. But again, as I mentioned, there wasn't, it wasn't purely based on an oral transmission. We have, we have entire codices, yeah, the Topaki, the B uh, Birmingham uh, um, a manuscript, go Google it if you want to have inf more information, uh, we can talk about it later. Within the first century, right, within the first century, we have an oral transmission of multiple chains of narration, multiple from the prophet himself to the companions to, um, uh, to absolute, to even to this day, right? through all the modes of, modes of recitation. And there the, they're from the people who'd witnessed it. We have we, the closest um, uh, full code, uh, codex that we have is one of the copies of Othman's, uh, Othman's text, which was compiled by companions. It wasn't compiled by one person. The first compilation of the Quran was within two years of the Prophet's death. During the time of Abu Bakr, he commissioned Zayd ibn Thabit um, uh, to not to, to bring together verses, and each verse that any uh, each verse that any companion had to bring, they had to have two witnesses. It had to be written down. It had to be memorized in uh, um, in the presence of the Prophet, and they also had to do two witnesses. So a controlled um, a, a controlled uh, transmission is a scientific transmission, if that makes sense. It can be audited, right? We can we can confidently. Uh, conclude that this is uh, whether you agree with the contents or not. We're having, if we're having a horror, historical discussion, I'm not trying to turn this into a theological discussion, but at the very, very least, you can agree that a controlled transmission done by the very people that it was revealed to, that witnessed the revelation, and then carried on to uh, others, that's always going to be a more faithful representation of what the actual text was. Now, when, when Dr. White mentions uh, P45, P52, 72, Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Sinaiticus, yep, that's the only full codex that we have of the, uh, uh, um, of the New Testament, right? And again, when we, when, uh, just to quickly track back a little bit, we sort of glossed over the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a whole, a huge part of Christianity. It might not form modern Christianity uh, as uh, determined by Paul, but it's a huge part of the text. It's part of the Bible. And in uh, the oldest uh, manuscript of the Old Testament is probably um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls at best. And that's about 4,000 years, 4,000 year history. And, and we can only go 300 years BC. How do we know? We're, we're linking and we're attaching, uh, we're attaching our salvation in the hereafter. This is a really important discussion. We can have a discussion around, okay, this is, it's a book of faith. I have no problem with that. But if we're gonna have a historical discussion, if somebody uh, had to objectively audit this, they would determine, they would have to determine how, how they can compare it to the originals. Now that brings me to a really interesting point about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The fact that we have P40, uh, P52, which is within the uh, start of the uh, second century, we don't have the original of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, right? The best we have is a credit card statement of, um, uh, of uh, some of the verses of John, right? So in what, how can we possibly audit uh, the original. How can we know what's the original? Compare that to the Quran. It was not only it was memorized, it was also written down. It was put together twice. But during the time of uh, the uh, cal caliphate of Abu Bakr, which was the first caliph, two years after the, uh, the death of the prophet, and then Uthman, within 20 years, within 20 years it was brought together. And yes, it was uh, the, uh, one of the triggers of Uthman comp uh, uh, commissioning the co compilation or the Uthmanic compilation was because there was different recitations. Now, the question of different recitations, we're talking about potential different recitations, but we at least have the, we, we at least have the close um, ascription of the text. 
What three and a half centuries later in Codex Sinaiticus, that's the, that's the whole book by the time we have that. Just, uh, put your imagination um, uh, or put your historian hat um, on and, and just imagine uh, the transmission of ancient texts. Not only scribal errors, uh, error, uh, um, uh, times where someone made an error and then someone tried to f fix that error not knowing what the original was and that keep going. How, do you, how can you determine that? Certain parts of, and I, and, I, and I respect that Dr. Whiteworth made those admissions, there's certain parts of the, the, uh, the New Testament that we can now confidently determine that it's not part of the New Testament and they were later forgeries because they don't exist in, for example, Codex Sinaiticus, which we only, we only um, found that recently. So prior to that, people were taking that as faith. Now, uh, as a Muslim, if I, if, I, if I confidently knew that, if I found out that a certain part of the Quran was not the Quran, or I think that would have, um, that would be powerful, I think, at the very, very least. Um, now, so we, the Muslims do have a written transmission. Yeah, there's no critical textual uh, studies uh, in the way that um, uh, Dr. White is describing because it's so controlled, right? The whole point of textual uh, criticism is to determine what the original text is. And because there's so much variance, that's the, that's the auditing task for many Christian scholars. Um, uh, in the Islamic faith, there's a very, very strong introspective and reflective tradition within the tradition to determine, and that's called the Isnad system, the system of chain of narration. So in the Islamic tradition, we only take from people that we know, people that we know who they are. So we know the chain of transmission. This person studied under this person, spoke to this person, spoke to this person, and we know who this person is. We know his biography. We know whether he's reliable. We don't take from this guy was old, this guy this did, for example, this guy didn't have um, a, a good memory or he had certain biases and that sort of stuff. So the controlled, for something like this, for something as heavy, as heavy as, as, as determining our salvation and our faith, um, uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to determine the accuracy. But nevertheless, from the Islamic point of view, we, we believe that um, the Bible was never meant to be preserved anyway. There was no promise, there was no divine promise that we will, will, will be preserved. Um, and so for that reason, the Quran, the, uh, God, uh, Allah, Allah comes in the, Quran, in the Quran says, and he, he guards the Quran. Not only does he, um, uh, does he, uh, does he claim that it, will be pres uh, that it will be preserved, but he asks, he doesn't just say that this is the word of God and just believe me. He asks, he asks mankind three falsification tests. Three falsification tests. The first one, that it will be preserved. The second is that uh, you, would, uh, you will not find contradictions um, uh, or mistakes within it. And the third, you will not be able to replicate even a chapter like it. So it, provide, it gives mankind an opportunity to falsify. Now, Muslims have never had a... Pro uh, I mean, Islamic civilization has never had a, a shortage of enemies uh, or, or people who are motivated to undermine an entire civilization. And, and God has basically just said, here you go. Be my guest. Give it a shot, right? To determine, the, to demonstrate the divine authorship through ref reflecting. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many minutes I have left. Two minutes? Okay, I'll just quickly uh, cover up. Um, uh, there's a few other points. Um, so we don't have the highest level of, we have the highest level of confidence that, that you can have uh, for the New Testament, right? up to the third century at best. And even then there's, there's, there's variations within that. Three and a half centuries, well, I mean, you can just go through Christian history and don't pretend that it's like, um, that it's this uniform history and uniform doctrine that, um, uh, that you know, it was just literally passed on, you know, um, all the church fathers, all the different denominations, all the different beliefs, all the different um, uh, bringing together of the, the creed of the Trinity, putting the, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, within there. So many things that uh, the church fathers had to decide uh, at the time. Um, the last point that I wanted to touch was particularly the uh, not anonymity of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the uh, of the four, uh, of the four Gospels. The fact that uh, they don't it was never they were, they were authored anonymously in the sense that it was not ascribed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, uh, it was these were ascriptions that were given to them at least a century and a half later. Justin, during, for example, Justin Martyr. That's the time, that's probably the first time uh, in history that these Gospels were titled Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to begin with, right? Uh, um, and you compare that to the Quran, we know exactly who it came to, we, need, we know exactly um, who, uh, 
uh, who attempted to compile it and who preserved it. And to this day, those chains of transmission exist. And to this day, um, we have many, many manuscripts. I wish I brought, I brought that book in the other, um, uh, in the other debate. Um, the Timeless Quran, I think that's called, by Mustafa Azami. Basically, what he's done is provided manuscripts, manuscript evidence, yeah, taken up from, from uh, the manuscripts themselves, um, from, from um, India all the way to North Africa, and, and from, each, from each century of the Islamic civilization. So we can demonstrate from both from an oral tradition as well as a textual tradition that the Islamic um, scripture is faithful. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, we're now going to move into a 30-minute section where we are going to have cross-examination and some dialogue. Each speaker will be given 15 minutes to lead those questions. So I'd like to ask Dr. White to begin in the first 15 minutes. All right, uh, Abdullah, just a few uh, quick questions. Um, how long after Muhammad did uh, Imam Bukhari live? A few hundred years. A few hundred years. And so the narrations that you are depending upon for the establishment of the accuracy of the Quran were collected l as long after Muhammad as Codex Sinaiticus was written after the end of the New Testament age, right? The parallel of the Hadith versus the, the actual scripture of God um, I don't. I don't buy that. They're two in, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, the Hadith and uh, the Quran uh, are not one. So to represent them as one, um, uh, I wasn't assuming that. I'm, I'm simply so, saying that if uh, I'm simply asking if you can have accurate information that is foundational to your position in Bukhari, and that's collected hundreds of years. And yet you're saying that if Sinaiticus is hundreds of years, that that, that somehow is a problem. It seems, it seems to be inconsistent. So uh, Bukhari uh, was penned 300 years, right? So all Bukhari did was comp bring the Hadith together, bring the authentic uh, narrations of the Prophet, peace be upon him, together into one book. They existed way before in Bukhari. In fact, they existed during the time of the Prophet where, where, um, uh, where and this is just one, one canonical book, right? There's many compilations of Hadith prior to Bukhari. Uh, he's, he's, he only has a particular special uh, section because of his mode of classification. Such as, such as Mukatul's collection, right? There's many. And yet, and Imam, yet, Imam Malik's Muatta was within, uh, within less than a century uh, uh, of... Um, but, but isn't it true that Mukatul is not viewed as having authority because he didn't use the later development of, of Isnad standards that only come a couple hundred years later? The Isnad, the, the Isnad standards existed from uh, right from the beginning. That was that was core of the the, uh, the, uh, the Arab and the Islamic tradition in the beginning. Then Imam, why didn't Imam Malik's Muatta demonstrates that very perfectly. Then the why didn't Muqattal use them? Imam Malik. So what it is is they compiled hadith into a book. Imam Malik's hadith. There's many of Imam Malik's hadith that are also in, for example, Bukhari's hadith or or, right. uh, or Muslim's hadith. So for example, let me give this example. Um, uh, in many of Imam Malik's hadith. The chain of narration, because he lived in Medina so close to the death of the Prophet, the chain of narration is two people, three people, right? So uh, that demonstrates the, the, uh, the time lapse between. How, isn't it true that of all the hadith that Bukhari or Muslim examined, that the majority they rejected is not being Sahih? They had a very, there's, so there's levels of classification. Right, Sahih, uh, Hassan, so on and so forth. But so, no, it's a little bit more than that. Um, so, uh, Mutawatir, uh, right. uh, and that's, that's the highest level of classification, where that's mass transmitted to an extent where, uh, by multiple independent chains of narration, yeah? So it was in, it's impossible for all these people to come together and conspire. That level of hadith, there's, a, only, there's only a small right. percentage of them. Right. The other hadith, they're, they're, um, uh, you know, many of them are, yeah, uh, as you said, uh, authentic, um, reliable, uh, weak, uh, fabricated. But this classification but, system exists because but my, uh, uh, Islamic scholars sought to discern that. I, I understand his hadith sciences. My, my point is that there were many, many hadith that existed at that point in time that had isnad chains that were rejected as being unreliable. Is that not the case? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, so it is the case. Well, okay. Yeah, just, there was a hadith that was rejected because they were not reliable. That's the point. That's why they rejected. But they all had isnad chains, or they well, yeah, would not even been examined. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So 
when you say that, for example, uh, let, me, let me just make sure that we get a, a chance to, uh, you said when you gave uh, the standards for Abu Bakr and then Uthman's creation of their Mus'haf, uh, you said that there had to be multiple witnesses and, and all the rest of these things. Where are you getting that information from? How long after that event is your earliest reference to that standard? So you're saying, can I can you explain that a little bit further? So when, of... when you, you very quickly mentioned, um, and I've, I read the book that you gave to uh, Joe Ash. I, so I was hoping to actually give that to you, but you can get I've, it off. I have it in my library. Get it off I, have a, I have a very good library, actually. <laughs> I've read the book, yeah. and the argument there is that, the, and it's been repeated to me in numerous other debates, is that there, is, there was this standard that was in application at that time for the creation of Mus'haf, Mus'haf including multiple attestation, multiple witnesses, so on and so forth. I, um, what I'm asking you is, what is the earliest historical evidence you have to substantiate that claim? So those, those, uh, uh, that narrative, of course, comes from, uh, yes, and I agree, comes from the hadith. But the hadith were, they were written and memorized then and there. They were, they were only brought into books in the later centuries. So certain scholars sought to comply, compile them. So the hadith existed during the time of Abu Bakr, during the time of Omar. So that's within two to 20 years. But but your first knowledge of it comes from hundreds of years later. No, it doesn't. It was the first time it was printed in a book, comes, uh, uh, printed in a book like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it comes a couple hundred years later. And, there, uh, and, and if you just read Bukhari 6, 509 and 510, those, those uh, standards are not included in that narration by Bukhari, are they? The standards, the, the standards differ amongst the scholars, but that's, that's fine. So but the, the standard about having multiple... Uh, attestation and witnesses is not found in Bukhari, is it? I'd have to check that. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure because that was a that was a uh, uh, a very important issue. Um, I, don't, I don't think I don't think the argument rests on that point though. Okay, on one solitary narration. Uh, so, um, I, 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 it's, all right. Let's let's talk a little bit about anonymous authors. Um, if Jesus was a prophet, then he would have only quoted. Uh, from reliable sources. Is that true? Jesus, well, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So when Jesus quotes from the broad portion of the Old Testament, and we don't know who wrote many of the sections he quoted from, was he in error for quoting no, from I'm, those sections? I will clarify that. No, I, no I'm, not, I'm not saying uh, that, uh, that there's no truth contained within either the Old Testament or the New Testament. I'm just saying I'm, I'm putting a question mark in terms of how can we determine that truth. I, I didn't, and how do we know? That's, that's how can we know d divine truth? So but, but, I, I can say that generally. Okay, but that's that's not what I asked. Jesus said that the scriptures cannot be broken in John chapter ten. You can't use the New Testament to you taking the New Testament for granted. You can't. That's a circular. That's circular reasoning. There is no possible way to talk about what Jesus said without going to the quotations of him from the first century. But that assumes that the New Testament, or that quotation is a reliable and authentic quotation of what Jesus said. To begin and with. you believe every word about Jesus in the Quran, right? Of course, yeah. Okay, and yet there's 600 years between the quotations of Jesus in the Quran and when Jesus lived, and can you show me any historical evidence whatsoever during 600 years that Jesus said those words. So the, the challenge brought, brought, brought to man that God makes, we're saying that this, is, this book is authored by, uh, by God, not by Jesus, right? And so God has got eternal knowledge, all-knowing uh, uh, all and whatnot. So if we can determine, if we can test that, that, that falsification test that God gives all, all, all of mankind, we can establish a confident foundation of that text altogether. And in doing so, that answers that question from an epistemological point of view. So I'm trying to see, because you, you, you said we need to use the same standards. It, you're, you're saying I cannot quote from first century materials written by the disciples of Jesus and say Jesus quoted from this or Jesus quoted from that. But you accept the words of Jesus that are found in the Quran that have absolutely, positively no historical pedigree for 600 years. That's a really interesting point, the first point. Let's take it one step at a time. Um, uh, which, for, which, uh, which textual writings of, of any of the disciples are you referring to that we have at the moment? You um, said that you mentioned you were referring to the text written by the disciples? Yes. Do we have any of them at all? Well, the specific quotation I gave you is when Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken in John chapter 10, or I can give you Matthew chapter 22. Uh, I, saw, I, don't, Luke, I, saw, I don't believe Mark, that, I'm, I'm asking, I'm I'm uh, the reason why I'm questioning it is because you're taking that for granted. 
So if you're saying that this is the this is actually what this is, we have the text of the disciples. I think we need to put a we need to ask that in a more reflective point of view. Do we have the text of the actually? I'm yes, we, ask questions no, they're they're, they're okay. Um, if you I'll, want to I'll, raise, I'll ask if, the questions. That's fine. Please do. If you want to raise any question concerning any of those texts as to their text, I'd be happy to address it. There's no textual vari variation that's relevant at this point. My point is that we can't have a discussion about what our texts say if you say, well, you can't quote from the New Testament as having relevance to Jesus, but I can quote my text as relevant to Jesus, but I have zero historical, so you just simply have to accept my, my acceptance of, of a text that comes 600 years after my, yours. My, my argument was not based on that. My, I didn't, I, the, all I, the only verse that I mentioned was the verse that asked mankind or challenged mankind to test the veracity of, of the Quran. It didn't, we did, I, didn't make any, I didn't make any reference to Jesus. I didn't make any claim to truth. So I, the only claim to truth that I made was to question the foundation uh, of the text itself. But I was simply pointing out that Jesus, in the first century documents, quotes from the Old Testament and books that we do not know who their so authors which are. So which first century document are you referring to? If, the if New P, Testament. If, if, P, if P, uh, P52, if I read the number right, yeah, uh, if P52 was within the turn of the second century, and that was the earliest thing we have, what do we have from the first century? We don't have anything from the first century. That's my point. You would not expect to have anything from the first no, century. I, I would be the not, closest I any other work, of, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm making an argument there. I'll be glad to refute that later on. But so do you have any first century copies of the Quran? If not, you can't qu quote from them. Yeah, the Topaki and the Birmingham manuscript. Are very, very close within the but first they, century. But neither one of those are complete. So any other sections of the Quran, you can't they're, quote they're from, They're very right? close. It's, it's, I mean, if we're making a comparison discussion, compared to the complete version of, uh, which is Codex Sinaiticus, that's three and a half centuries. So no, but we have, but we have the vast majority of the New Testament in the papyri that, that go to the first, that go to the second, third centuries. You're just not aware of the existence of those, 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 those books. Okay, but the point you, is, you if you're going to, to say, yeah, um, but, but the point is, are you actually saying that we cannot quote from anything in the Gospels unless we have a first century manuscript? I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that if you do, you, uh, you fall into that potential fallacy of you taking, a, taking um, uh, assuming uh, the, the authenticity of the text to then determine the authenticity of others. Why aren't, why aren't you assuming the corruption of the text rather than the authenticity I'm not assuming, of the text? No, it's the, way, the way logic works, and I'm very sure you're very sure aware of it, if you're making the claim, you have, to deter, you have to substantiate it. I'm asking a question. You're making the claim that it is a faithful representation, so it's the onus of responsibility is for you to demonstrate okay. that it is. So, so, so who, do you, who, who are your experts that say that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not first century documents? Um, uh, textual criticism scholars. <laughs> no, not even Bart Ehrman agrees with you. I've debated him. I've, 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 actually, I've watched that. That's, that's one debate that that's I have right. watched. That's right. Um, uh, Bruce so so uh, not, even, not even Bart Ehrman believes they're second century what's, documents. What's actually, the claim? So, well, well, actually, can you say that claim again? Just so I can, I can answer you. Bart Ehrman no, does well, not, not even that. argue that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are second century. They're first century No, I'm not documents. arguing that. I'm not, that's not my... I'm not that's saying what that I had asked century. you. I said, what I'm scholar... You don't have first century material. You don't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't have it. You don't even have no one. No one has ever claimed that we do. Okay, it's so irrelevant to anyone who, who puts no, together really ancient documents. I think it's really relevant to this discussion today because but if you, you don't have the original, how can you determine what the original looks like? Okay, you don't have the original of the Quran, so therefore you can't know but what the But we have Quran a controlled like. transmission and we have a very close original. Uh, we have, within two years, it was compiled in one book. But, as okay, okay so, so you're using one standard... You don't know what that book looked like. You're pushing the date of the Mus'haf back so that you can say that you have a first century one. If you use that standard, neither one of us can quote our books, right? Uh, no, uh, because we have two modes of uh, preservation and transmission where, you're, where the, the New Testament has only got one. Nobody memorized the New Testament. It was passed on a story to story, copy to copy, and, uh, and that we have what we have left. Uh, okay, and that's what we have. so, so the... the the extra, uh, the writings of the New Testament, uh, writings that outside of the New Testament, such as Clement, the Didache, uh, Ignatius, all these things within a within hundred years of the original, you just discount their quotations of the New Testament? That's not the original. I'm not I, saying I, I, it's the original. Yeah, but, but that's... But, that's, but, but so you're, I, I you're saying... Point, you can see that there's no original. I'm happy, I'm happy with that. Um, I'm, I and no, I'm, no, no one has ever argued otherwise. That's, okay. and, and no historian has ever argued otherwise. That's why I'm just trying to understand how you don't have an original of the Quran and you, you will say, but I can still quote it. 
And then you say, but you can't quote from anything in the New Testament, even though it's a first century document, and we have the earliest attestation of any work of antiquity uh, that goes back to that point. So I don't you, understand the, how, this is how the, you can say this is consistent. This is a comparative discussion between the Quran and the Bible. So if we're going to compare it, and maybe if I had a, if I would have, had a project, I could draw a table of comparison, yeah? Uh, so we have one that, would, that we have the... the uh, the first time we actually even agreed on uh, Matthew, Mark, or the 27 books of the Bible was uh, or during the time of Athanasius, so about three centuries anyway. Conus Sinaiticus, three and a half centuries. Compare that to the Quran. Within the first two years, it was written in a book. Within, um, uh, within uh, 20 years, it was, um, uh, it was standardized. We had, we had an oral transmission and a, and a written transmission. You only had a written transmission. The earliest... The earliest um, uh, 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 manuscript within a century. Earliest manuscript, full manuscript within three centuries. Why do you, if we're just having I, 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 a I need to stop discussion, you. why do you keep do saying full manuscript? Your the top copy is not full. There's missing part. part. We have the to top copy and the Birmingham. The Birmingham but they're not complete. Close. They're fragments. They're very. They're not fragments. I think that's. I think that's a very very. Well, they're long fragmentary. Stretch. They're missing they're, portions. I mean, if if you call, they're missing uh, portions. If you call like seventy five percent or eighty percent of it a frag fragment, um, I think we got more than that. Yeah. No, you don't need to ring it. We already stopped. No, please, please ring it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We now are going to move into the next 15 minutes segment, and this will be very quiet. I'm happy to just continue where we left off, um, mainly because, uh, I mean, I'll give you another opportunity to ring that bell anyway. Um, so, given what you mentioned about, uh, uh, okay, I guess, we, we, I think we've established that the originals don't exist, right? And of course we, not. Okay, cool, lovely, good start. Yeah, the originals don't exist. The copies of the originals don't even exist. Uh, and there were, and the, the mode of transmission that you described was uh, the free transmission of the text, which I'll read more about in your book. Um, uh, and that editing took place in certain times. There were certain. There certain. What do you uh, mean editing? So, for example, we mentioned how there was certain insertions or certain parts of the that's, that's uh, not that editing. we know about. We know about. Yeah, that's not editing. You don't call that an edit? No. Okay. No, so it's, it's real simple. In, in the ancient world, when you would make a manuscript and you made a mistake and missed something, you would write it in the margin. The copyist, if he could not ask you, if you weren't alive anymore. That didn't always happen. You know, that's why, that's why there's so many differences. Could I, could I finish the, the sentence? Lovely. Question. Okay, I need to finish the sentence. Um, and therefore, you had things called glosses. The copyists were conservative, and so they would not want to miss anything. And so, for example, John chapter 5, verse 4 was probably a marginal interpretation that became incorporated in later manuscripts. So that's not editing, because editing would in involve the purposeful changing of what is there. This is just simply a copyist doing the best he can to make sure he copies everything that's in the exemplar before him. Okay. Um, so given... Uh I mean, that's, that's essentially the question, the question that we're asking. What, uh, what reasons do we have to believe that this is... Actually, actually, the first question I should have asked is this, really. Um, do you believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? I do. You do? Um, and so in, in, and you also believe that uh, God does not make any mistakes? Yes. Would you also then say that God will preserve uh, his, uh, his word? He did through the manuscript tradition in a particular fashion, through the free transmission of the text, yes. So if you, if you qualify preservation as uh, um, uh, variation that we only, f we only were able to determine only after we reveal, only after we found Sinaiticus, for example. You, you, have, you, have, a, you have a very ahistorical understanding of Sinaiticus. It wasn't found just recently. Von Tischendorf was in the 19th century. Codex Vaticanus preceded it. It was known to Erasmus in the 16th century. So prior to those, prior to those, prior to those, prior to those uh, revelations, how did we understand uh, the text? They were not revelations. Oh, I mean, prior to those finding out that we found those. Uh, and the, the Greek manuscript tradition had been going along just fine uh, up until that, that period of time. So do we have more information upon which to do textual criticism today than we have in the past? Of course. That does not mean that uh, at the time of the Reformation, for example, there was not a perfectly adequate Greek manuscript tradition that communicates the exact same message that we have today. That's what you need to understand, is that these variations do not change the theology of the text. Uh, 
They might change the number of verses that we quote in support of a particular reading, but they do not change the theology of the text, and even Bart Ehrman recognizes that and admits that. Okay, I'm not Bart Ehrman, so good for him. Um, but, but, you <laughs> seem, but you seem to like his sources. Oh, yeah, do you really? Um, that's good. Uh, what else is there? But no, you're not Bart Ehrman. You're much nicer than Bart Ehrman. Oh, I love it. Thanks. <laughs> you I, can it. I can tell you stories, but I will not take your time to do so. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Ask me some more about those variants. Uh, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I had to talk way too fast. Um, all right, so let's just make a direct comparison, yeah? Let's not make a direct comparison between the Bible and the Bible and, 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 and the Quran. Could I could I point out that we that I pointed out that we can't do that? We have to as, as best as we possibly can. This is the nature of today's discussion, surely. But but, but, but this, is, this is where my objection is. Um, there is a 600-year difference. There is a language difference. And we're only ta and if we're talking about the Bible, it's more than 600 years. But if we're just limited to the New Testament, because you keep mentioning Sinaiticus. So you have multiple authors, you have a different language, and you have a 600-year difference. So when we compare them, that always has to be included. Okay, that's okay. In, we can in, still make a comparison. Discussion. And the fact that the Quran is its initial uh, promulgation is in a time period where people are friendly in the Islamic world to its text over against 250 years for the New Testament where the Roman Empire is not friendly to its text at all. Those are, there, there are major differences that have to be historically taken into consideration. Yeah, so, and, and we, can fairly, uh, we can fairly attribute or appreciate the context of either in, in making that comparison, yeah? Yes, very much so. Okay, so uh, if, we can, if we can determine the chain of transmission, uh, uh, orally and textually, which the Quran can, how is that a weakness uh, as opposed to a strength? Because what you've described in terms of the mode of transmission for, uh, for the New Testament in particular, you've highlighted particular challenges, which if anything requires more answers, which makes it more difficult, which, uh, which is the whole point of this discussion, right? Where, Actually, um, Actually, I think the problem here is that, that you seem to be interpreting the massive amount of data that we have that no other work of antiquity possesses with it being a problem. What it means is we just have to do harder work. We have lots of data in the Quran. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that assertion that there's, I mean, yeah, in terms of numbers, absolutely, but there's huge amount of data of, um, uh, of manuscripts um, with, uh, in the centuries for Islamic, the Islamic I am, I am across unaware. the world. I am unaware of unaware. any catalog. Well, I should have brought it. I actually, I actually have a catalog for you. I should have brought it in. That includes collations of manuscripts and the citation of variations. That, that author, Azami, yeah, yes, he's, I, before, I, I, before I, I he passed away, yes. he actually published that. We, um, we had manuscripts from all 14 centuries of the Islamic civilization from across the world, and he compared uh, word by word. Um, is, that, uh, is, that a, is that a question? No, I'm saying that you uh, I'm giving right. you a reference. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm just, my, my point is um, that that's not, that's not the same, that's not how people do textual criticism of ancient documents. And, and even if we put the Quran into that, into that category, uh, there, there is no weighting of manuscripts, there is no critical edition where you and I can sit there and look at the manuscripts and analyze what the variants are and what their meaning might be did he, I don't, I do not believe that that included the Sa'ana readings at all, did it? It does. Uh, the the uh, manuscripts in Yemen, uh, he actually, in the, in the book, in the preface, he describes that he had special access to them, uh, and he included it in that. Um, but included in any, any collations? Uh, I'm, okay, in I'm answering, I'm can asking Can I answer question. Last, one last but question? Let me, um, let, uh, let me go back to answer yep. what, you, what you actually said. You seemed, you, you say, isn't our way superior? And that is assuming the accuracy of the Isnad chains and the entire concept of Hadith sciences. And my question to you was to point out that in my understanding, uh, the majority of the Hadith that Imam Bukhari or Imam Muslim examined were rejected by them. They all had Isnad chains. So simply having an Isnad chain, I don't know of anyone outside of Medina uh, or Al-Azhar, who thinks that that is a truly valid historical mechanism for doing historical study. 
you want to have manuscripts, you want to have, you want to have citations of manuscripts, in other words, external writings, uh, Mukatul or someone like that. And yet, Mukatul is, is put off to the side and not allowed to speak to these things because of that artificial application of, of the Isnad concept. So, I, I, I don't accept the idea that that is a, a greater way of transmitting things. And it does strike me that again, six, let's look at the time period. Um, the Quran, in writing, would you, in, in my, let me put this in the form of an answer. The Quran tells the people of the book that they have nothing to stand on unless they look to their own scriptures, right? Uh, Surah uh, 5, as I recall. It, five, makes, a, 60, it makes a qualification after it says that. It, it, it then talks to, to uh, in light of Muhammad's revelation of the Quran. I, yes, I'm aware of that. But it says that to the people of, of the book. And then it says to Muhammad, if you have any doubts, talk to those who are reading the scriptures before you. So it seems to me anyways that this hyper-skepticism that is the modern Islamic perspective really goes back to Itzar al-Haq and does not go back to Muhammad. It's Arl Haq. You familiar with the book? Uh, 1864, Indian oh, no, scholar. It predates that, sure. It predates that far. We have but the, but the hyper in the 11th uh, But the hyper skepticism. The hyper skepticism. I know that Ibn well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a couple of um uh, of quotes that from Orientalist scholars and also a Bible scholar as well. So Orientalist scholar, and I'll finish. Do I get this. to respond to them? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, um, I'll, I can give it to you if you want. Anyway, um, uh, so Orientalist scholar A. T. Welch says. Um, from, for Muslims, in the, the Quran is much more than scripture or sacred literature in the usual Western sense. It's a primary significance for the vast majority through the centuries has been uh, in its oral form, in the form in which it has appeared, as a recitation chanted by Muhammad and his followers over the period of time of about 20 years. And the revelations were memorized uh, by some of Muhammad's uh, followers during his lifetime, and the oral tradition that was thus established also had a continuous history ever since in, um, in many independent ways. Um, uh, and also through the written Quran. Through the centuries, the oral tradition of the entire Quran was being maintained by the professional reciters. Until recently, the this, this significance uh, of the recited Quran has seldom been fully appreciated by the West. Now, a Bible scholar, Kenneth Clay. Okay, no, wait, 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 wait. wait Kenneth Clay, no, 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 you're, fill, you're, fill, you're filling the whole time with, with, with yeah, more citations. That's, you're, you're cheating a little bit over there, uh, okay? I'll go four minutes. Okay, okay so go. because... Because, as I pointed out, the motivation for the revision under Uthman was differences in citation. You know that there are different arufs as the way it is, it, is, it is actually cited. And I am really concerned when I read Bukhari to see that there were entire uh, ayat that were located, found after the original Abu Bakr collation that were inserted at a later time. Which ones were they? We only know the, there's, there's one reference given to us, but it's very clear from the narration that there were other ones. Which ones were they? How do we know? There is, there is, there, there is a lot of questions that, that are raised as to how you can go from multiple reciters into a written text. And I have sources that are contemporaneous with yours um, from Christian sources that knew of the Hadith that say that there had, been, there had been things that were lost by that point in time. So I can go to the same time period and provide quotations if you want me to. We don't have time anymore. But uh, I, I, gave, I gave them, they're, they're actually yeah, in that nice. little book yeah. right next to your, your elbow right there. Thank you. So, so take uh, a look um, at it. Just on that point, so you're, you're referencing the Hadith's uh, Hadith uh, sciences or the collection, and then questioning them at the same time. There's many things that Bukhari said as well that we are aware that, that. So if we we can't pick and choose in what we take, the second uh, the second. I'm sorry. Did you say we can't pick and choose? We can't pick and choose. Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna selectively pick and choose and decontextualize uh, um, uh, certain hadith, that's not how that's not how. Um, uh, okay. That's I'm just want, I just want to understand what you're saying. Are you saying that you that you either take all of Bukhari? If you're gonna take or, a Bukhari as a reliable source of evidence to throw back here, well then you've got to take the rest of it too. You can't just pick pick what uh, pick what you uh, potentially uh, and decontextualize that as well. Could could I, could I could I point out that from my perspective? Bukhari clearly contains really important information. I think 6519 and 510 is particularly important for one simple reason. It's a little bit embarrassing. And that means I think it has greater evidence of being historically accurate. And I can find Bukhari, the core of what Bukhari was saying, in non-Muslim sources. That means it's really, really solid. 
But are you saying that we cannot critically analyze what sources he would have had? What I'm saying is that the Islamic tradition, as you've already demonstrated, has, has a, a version of textual criticism for the, in the fact that if, Muslims, if Bukhari, for example, you know, why did he bother to narrate that if he, uh, if, he, if he didn't have a reflective, introspective approach? Right? The Islamic tradition has a, a reflective, introspective approach to their own texts, which is why certain criticism of certain claims are also preserved within the tradition. And this has been analyzed by scholars. This is not something that um, uh, is, is, is a revelation, when, if I when, can use that word. When, when you say this has been analyzed by scholars, let me point out, every variant that you've mentioned has been analyzed by yeah, scholars yeah, 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 all yeah. the way back to the early church. I'm not bringing anything new, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, but the way that you presented it, it almost sounded like you were pointing out things that we didn't know. For example, the Kama Yohanium. I, I, I mean, no one at the Council of Nicaea quoted the Kami Yohanim in defense of their positions. So, obviously, it was not relevant to the early churches. Well, we're, allowed to, we're allowed to state the obvious in this. Dis I mean, I'm not assuming anyone's knowledge on anything, so let's just, we, can, we can have discussions from, uh, you know, from first principles. Uh, I, don't mind do I don't mind doing that, um, so for that reason. 30 seconds. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. White. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both very much. We're now going to move into a time of some closing remarks. Each speaker is going to be given five minutes to bring these, and then at the end we'll bring all of these proceedings to a close. So if James could come and bring his closing remarks first. I heard someone yawn right then. I'm sorry, I hope that's not a commentary. <laughs> Oh, White speaking again. Okay, I get a little nap here for five minutes. All right. Um, well, I'm sorry if we uh, if if we got into the weeds a little bit there, but it, it, it's going to happen, and and it, and it needs to happen. And I'm I'm glad you were here to observe it. It can be done without people flying over desks and attacking other people and beating them with books and things like that. Um, this is a very important discussion, and what it does highlight, my fellow Christians, those of you in the audience who are, is the need for us to know the history of our text. Uh, I have for over 30 years been seeking to, and I don't think you're 30 years old yet, right? I'll take that. I'll take that, okay. <laughs> um, I have uh, for th over 30 years been seeking to educate Christians about the history of their text, to realize that it was given to them in a particular fashion. The Book of Romans was once a papyrus that was in a leather bag being carried by a man along the dusty roads to Rome, and that man had never heard of deodorants. It happened in history. You need to understand that. And for a long period of time, longer than the Quran, that was transmitted to us in handwritten copies. Now, thankfully, we have very excellent early manuscripts of the New Testament. And in fact, I didn't get a chance to do this. Let me just, just point one out. We have one uh, Gospels manuscript that contains almost all of Luke and John called P75. And we know, we can tell by the readings, that P75 is related to Codex Vaticanus. So P75 is about 175 AD. Codex Vaticanus is about 325, 350. They both go to a preceding ancestor. Vaticanus is not a copy of P75, we know that. But they both had an ancestor that means that when P75 and, and, and Vaticanus have the same reading, that reading goes back to at least 150, probably 125, as early as P52, the little credit card that has been mentioned numerous times before. But P75 is, is entire books. It's not just a little shred. So you see, we have in the papyri far more information than I think Abdullah is familiar with in regards to that period of time. But the reality is, if you use the standard that I think he was using, and that is, you either need to have the originals, we do not, do not claim to, or you have to have something from the first century. Was that the first century 100 years after the time of, of the writings? Well, if, if Paul's writing as late as 60, that's 160, we're getting pretty close with something like that. But why is that? And who made up that rule? And if you follow that, we know nothing about history. Because our history, our knowledge of Rome, 
is based upon uh, Pliny and Tacitus and Suetonius, and the earliest manuscripts we have of anything they wrote are at least 500 to 900 years later. That means you can't quote any of those things. We don't know anything about history. That's why I was saying this is not how scholars do history. This is not how scholars do textual criticism. The fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, they're all first century documents is really not disputed by almost anyone. They are first century documents, and given that when we begin to have the early attestation of them, guess what? They all say the same thing. Oh, but there's a word different here, a word different there. I remember an atheist asking Bart Ehrman on a, on a, on a show once, so Dr. Ehrman, in light of all the textual variants, what do you think the New Testament was originally all about? And Bart Ehrman's like, it was about Jesus as the Son of God coming and dying on the cross and rising again for the salvation of the world? And the atheist is like, aww. He thought it was like space aliens or something like that. But the point is, Ehrman knows, anyone who studies textual criticism knows, that the manuscript tradition is united in the fact that it presents one message. And here's the key issue. The message it presents was not known to the author of the Quran. He did not know what Paul taught about Jesus. He did not know what John taught about Jesus. There is no evidence whatsoever that he was aware of that. And yet all the manuscripts from wherever they come from contain the same message, the same gospel. That really is one of the key issues that hopefully has been made clear this evening that you all get to think about more because this is just the beginning of a conversation, not the end of the conversation. And I thank you for being here to listen to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to engage with Dr. White. He's someone I've, uh, I've watched or have grown up uh, at least 30 years. Of, um, <laughs> I'm a bit younger than that. <laughs> um, so it, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to, have, to share this platform with him. And I echo the point on history. I had a, and uh, actually before I do that, before I forget, I think uh, Dr. White's a very big fan of Bart Ehrman. And if he is, um, you should go check him out. Um, um, but um, the point about history, um, actually after the debate we had in, uh, at Monash, um, uh, a good friend of mine, Rob, he might be in the crowd here, they sent me a video um, or something to listen to and uh, the speaker, the first thing he said was that a lot of, a lot of um, Christians go to secular universities and learn uh, about the Bible and they lose faith in it once they go into, uh, into textual criticism um, for many reasons and I, he, uh, he might be wrong on that. Um, but the point was what I, what I took from that is the importance of knowing our history and being academically faithful and, um, uh, and academic uh, in it, in, t uh, in, doing, in doing so. And so the history is really, really rich. History doesn't come from one perspective. Um, and there are many perspectives and many, and many conclusions that are brought forth. Um, I wanted this particular discussion not to be one about um, necessarily about faith per se, um, more about a historical accuracy, right? Um, in the sense that um, people believe in whatever they like to believe for whatever reasons they like to believe. That's fine, right? Um, and maybe perhaps many people uh, associate religion in that way as well. But in terms of if we're going to have a, a, an academic uh, um, comparative discussion, um, uh, you almost have to sort of uh, take that away a little bit in order to do that. Now, um, I'd like to end with uh, that, or to highlight uh, that the Islamic history is incredibly rich, incredibly rich and incredibly informative and, um, um, uh, and scientific in the sense that it can be audited, if that makes sense. So the history is, uh, is attested to by multiple uh, chains of narration of reliable sources, not just having the chain in and of itself. Um, uh, that, um, and these reliable sources can be known and audited to this day. Uh, coupled with a textual tradition, um, uh, I think that's incredibly strong and incredibly reliable, irrespective of what you think of the contents of the book. At the very, very least, you can conclude uh, that um, with, re with uh, beyond reasonable doubt that at least that there's a, a faithful transmission of what we had. And that's what I sought to um, present today, uh, that there, 
uh, that at the very, very least, we can, we can demonstrate that within two years of the death of the prophet, we can demonstrate the, 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 uh, the compilation and the preservation uh, of the revelation. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the New Testament, um, uh, naturally there's, we, there's, there's questions around it, but as a Muslim, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily ex expect the New Testament to have been preserved anyway, because God never um, promised to do that with, with that uh, particular um, uh, revelation, and that the Quran was brought for all of mankind. Um, uh, as, as the criterion uh, uh, between truth and falsehood. And so the Quran came to confirm the scriptures before it, including the Gospels, right? And what I mean Gospels is the revelation brought down to the messenger, Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, and so uh, in that way, the Quran acts as a guardian over them. And I encourage you to um, read, learn, um, uh, open up a Quran um, uh, and learn a little bit more about it, just as, just as much as you do for your Bible. So thank you very much again. Um, and I'll get my autograph soon. Thank you. Just one more time that you had one more minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank both of our speakers, James White, Abdullah Hamimi. Uh, we are very grateful for the time that you've given us. It is a wonderful opportunity for us. I want to thank you all as well for participating, listening so respectfully, and we are very grateful that you could be here.